The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication, podcast publishing made easy, Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. The Radio Memories Network welcomes you to the world of modern radio theater, an old medium revived for a new era through the Radio Memories Network. From the four corners of this world, there are more than 341 million people who speak English. This is the Society of the Ear, the Society of the Mind. Our voices are legion. Here we have the opportunity to spread stories through the theater of the mind all across the cyber byways and radial beacons. We are inclusive. We are eclectic. We are collective. We are the Sonic Society. Welcome to another meeting of the Sonic Society. I'm your host, Jack Ward. Each week we delve into the suspenseful and the sublime, the action-packed and the erudite. We look into masterpieces of audio cinema and some of the mayhem behind the sonic scenery. Membership is inclusive. You already have the best seat in the house. Before we get on with the meat of our meeting, I'd like to take this time to apologize to all our loyal listeners. Creating an eclectic show can sometimes be a hectic schedule that requires removing some materials for podcasts and adding others. It can also mean that previously scheduled material may be unavailable for one reason or another. Andrew and I have always considered our show to be a learning process, and it's our intention to continue to improve to bring you the best audio cinema available. In the past month, there have been some technical problems and some content issues. We're grateful for the many emails of encouragement as much as we are for those that provide us with advice on how to make this show the best we possibly can for you, the listener. So for this month of February, I would like any of our listening members to give us an email and tell us what you think. What do we do well? What could we improve on? What would you like to hear for next season? Who would you like us to interview? Would you like to see some practical tips on making radio drama? Or would you simply want more stories? Do you like serials? Would you prefer anthology stories? Crack your knuckles and tap out a few lines to us at sonicsociety at gmail.com or visit us at www.sonicsociety.org. Let your voice be heard so we can improve our show for the future. Now that the business aspect of the meeting is complete, on to the show. In our previous incarnation as Shadowlands Theatre, one of my very favorite forays into the past was listening to an old-time radio drama series, Sherlock Holmes, with Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. Rathbone was arguably the best Holmes, capturing some of the quirky spirit of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's creation. It was only after Jeremy Brett's turn on the BBC production that people considered there was a new great sleuth with the Deerstalker. This tale, adapted by Jim Court, was presented to us by our friend and member of the Society, Richard Froelich. Later, we'll have a discussion about podcasting with Andy Doan from Spaceship Radio. But without further ado, unbutton your collar... Check the pocket watch on the side table beside you. Stir the coals of the fireplace and relax in the smoking room as we listen to Brazilian Cat Solo here on the Sonic Society. The Brazilian Cat by Arthur Conan Doyle Adapted for audio by Jim Court. Driver, do you happen to know anything about Mr. Everard King at Greylands Court? Everard King? A fine gentleman, Governor, make no mistake. 
why there's not a charity anywhere around here that he hasn't subscribed to and generous like. He's always doing for others, that's what he is. Oh, I'm very pleased to hear it. It is hard luck on a young fellow to have expensive tastes, great expectations, aristocratic connections, but no actual money in his pocket. My father was convinced up to the day he died that his wealthy brother, Lord Southerton, would look after me, a position on the estate, perhaps, or a post in the diplomatic corps. But neither my uncle nor the state took the slightest notice of me. Everybody loves Mr. King round these parts. He's always throwing open Grayland so folks can come round and see his animals. What animals are they? Oh, bless you, Governor, don't you know? When he came back from South America, Mr. King brought a proper zoo back with him. Crates and crates of creatures from all them heathen lands, like a bloomin' Noah's Ark it was. Really? Right you are. He wants to try and raise them in a civilised climate. Oh, they're all about the place. Month by month, it was more and more difficult to get the brokers to renew my bills or to raise any further cash on the strength of my being Lord Southerton's heir. Despite frequent bouts of ill health, it appeared that my uncle had resolved to never die. Ruin lay right across my path, and every day I saw it clearer, nearer, and more absolutely unavoidable. Yeah, you see that, bud? Looks like a J, but bigger, see? Bright blue? That's one of them. No, I forget what that one's called. Oh, and, and see there, that, see that thing rooting around in the dirt? That's an armadillo, that is. Ugly brute, but the children seem to like it. Does Mr. King have children? <laughs> no, no, Governor, the school children round here, I meant. He's always having them round to entertain them. Like I say, always doing for others is Mr. King. I wouldn't be surprised if he's thinking of standing for Parliament. And then, one day, I received in the mail an invitation from my cousin, Everard King, to visit him at his estate in Suffolk. Cousin Everard had made a packet of money in South America and then returned home and bought Grayland's Court. I was surprised to hear from him. He had never taken much notice of me before, but I quickly saw this as my last chance. For the family credit, I didn't think my cousin would let me go to the wall, so it was either a short visit at Grayland's Court or a much longer one in Bankruptcy Court. And that was how I came to be in Clifton on the Marsh, riding in a dog cart on my way to Grayland's Court. Cousin Marshall, delighted to see you, old chap. Mr. Everard King's appearance was very homey and benevolent. Short and stout, 45 years old, perhaps, with a round, good-humoured face, burned brown with the tropical sun and shot with a thousand wrinkles. He wore white linen clothes in true planter style, with a cigar between his lips and a large Panama hat upon his head. And this is my wife, Marina. My dear, this is Cousin Marshall. I'm sure you remember me mentioning him. Welcome. She was a tall, haggard woman of Brazilian extraction, though she spoke excellent English. I could see in her dark, expressive eyes that I was not very welcome at Grayland's court. Had she divined so quickly the hidden purpose in my coming? It seemed incredible. I had convinced myself that I must be imagining it, but the next morning, after an excellent breakfast, I had reason to change my mind. Then the headman said, no, senor. The snake you have killed is not poisonous, but the one in the grass behind you certainly is. <laughs> <laughs> You're remarkably quiet this morning, my dear. Do you remember that headman? Joao was his name, I think? Yes. yes. Well, Cousin Marshall, I trust your room is comfortable? Yes, very much so. I can't thank you enough for inviting me. Oh, nonsense, old boy. The pleasure is entirely ours. Isn't it, my dear? Uh, if there's anything at all that I can do to add to your happiness, please let me know. As a matter of fact, I would like to talk to you about my Pardon uncle. Pardon me, sir. A telegram has arrived. Eh? Oh, yes. Will you excuse me? I just must attend to this. The best train in the day is at 12.15. I beg your pardon. The train. You should be on it. But I was not thinking of going today. Oh, if it rest with you. I am sure that Mr. Everard King would tell me if I were outstaying my welcome. What's this? What's this? Is there a problem, my dear? M might I trouble you to walk outside, Marshal? Certainly. I am no eavesdropper. I walked out into the lawn. I was convinced that the woman had seen through me, God knows how, and sought to protect her husband's checkbook from me. But I could not be put off. 
Cousin Everard was my last hope. I couldn't think what would happen if she confided her suspicions to him. Presently, I heard her footsteps. My husband has asked me to apologize to you, Mr. Marshall King. Please, do not say another word about it, Mrs. King. I quite understand... You fool! I hope that my wife has apologized for her foolish remarks. Oh, yes. Yes, certainly. You must not take it seriously. The fact is that my poor dear wife is incredibly jealous. She hates that anyone, male or female, should for an instant come between us. Tell me that you will think no more of it. No, no, certainly not. That is good of you. Now... Light this cigar and come round with me and see my little menagerie. The whole afternoon was occupied by our inspection, which included all the birds, beasts, and even reptiles that he had imported. Some were free, some in cages, a few actually in the house. Finally, he led me down a corridor which extended from one wing of the house. At the end of this, there was a heavy door with a sliding shutter in it, and beside it there projected from the wall an iron handle attached to a wheel and a drum. A line of stout bars extended across the passage. I am about to show you the jewel of my collection. There is only one other specimen in Europe, now that the Rotterdam cub is dead. It is a Brazilian cat. How does that differ from any other cat? Oh, you will soon see that. Will you kindly draw that shutter and look through? I slid back the shutter and found that I was gazing into a large, empty room with stone flags and small barred windows upon the farther wall. In the center of this room, lying in the middle of a golden patch of sunlight, there was stretched an enormous black cat, as large as a tiger, but black and sleek as ebony. It was so graceful, so sinewy, and so gently and smoothly diabolical that I could not take my eyes from the opening. Isn't he splendid? Glorious. I never saw such a noble creature. Some people call it a black puma, but really it's not a puma at all. That fellow is nearly 11 feet from tail to tip. He was sold to me as a newborn cub up in the wild country at the headwaters of the Rio Negro. They speared his mother to death after she had killed a dozen of them. Good Lord, a dozen? They are ferocious, then? The most absolutely treacherous and bloodthirsty creatures on earth. They prefer humans to game, you know. This fellow has never yet tasted living blood, but if he does, he will be a terror. At present, he won't stand anyone but me in his den. Even Baldwin the groom doesn't dare go near him. But I am his mother and father in one. I'll show you. I watched through the aperture in the door as Everard stepped inside the room and approached the beast. At the sound of his voice, it rose, yawned, and rubbed its round black head affectionately against his side while he patted and fondled it. Yes, yes, that's my good boy. Now, Tommy, into your cage. The monstrous cat walked over to one side of the room and coiled itself up under a grating. Everard King came out, and taking the iron handle that I mentioned, he began to turn it. This is how we work it. Give him the run of the room for exercise, and then at night we put him in his cage. Turn this crank and these bars slide into the room to keep him up. Turn it the other way and you let him out. There we are. Come on in and have a look at him. There, you see? The bars slide in from the passage and make quite an effective cage. How are you, Tommy? Are you my good boy? What a magnificent animal. So sleek and glossy. Oh, don't put your hand in there. I assure you, cousin, that he is not safe. You mustn't try to pet him. Don't imagine that because I can take liberties with him, anyone else can. He is very exclusive in his friends. Aren't you, Tommy? Ah, he 
here's his lunch coming to him. Don't you, Baldwin? Is he uh, in his cage, sir? Quite right, Baldwin. Come ahead. I brought his joint of beef, sir. Just pass it through the bars, Baldwin. Lunch time, Tommy. Nice joint of beef. <clears throat> yes, sir. Here you are. Come and get it. Here you are. <laughs> You know what he'd rather be lunching on, don't you, Baldwin? Uh, yes, sir. I do, sir. I, I, I'm always thinking he's going to grab me instead. Oh, Robert asked me to bring you this telegram, sir. It just arrived. Thank you. You may go. Yes, sir. I've never known anyone to receive so many telegrams. This is the third one today, isn't it? Yes, business, you know. It occupies me constantly. Uh-huh. Yes, well, I suggest we can do no better than follow Tommy's example and go to our lunch. I stayed at Greylands Court for six days, always looking for an opportunity to bring up my financial difficulties. One day, as we sat in the billiard room, I finally plucked up my courage and put the matter before him. And that's how it stands with me. I was hoping you could give me some advice. But surely you are the heir of Lord Southerton. You're in line just before me, I believe. I have every reason to believe so, but he would never make me any allowance. Yes, well, he always was a bit of a miser. By the way, have you heard any news of Lord Southerton's health lately? He has always been in a critical condition ever since I was a boy. Exactly. A a creaking hinge, if ever there was one. Your inheritance may be a long way off. Dear me, how awkwardly situated you are. I had some hope, sir, that you, knowing all the facts, might be inclined to advance me. Of course, dear boy, of course. Don't say another word. We shall talk it over tonight, and I give you my word that whatever is in my power shall be done. I shall be most grateful, cousin. Dear boy, I'm glad to do what I can. Now, what do you say to a game of billiards, eh? That evening, as I dressed for dinner, Mrs. King paid an unexpected visit to my room. Mrs. King! I must speak with you. Well, this is rather unorthodox, but I wish to speak to you as well. I know you have not been overly pleased to have me here. I must speak with you now. No, please let me finish. I want you to know that your husband and I have some business to discuss tonight after dinner, and then I shall be on my way. I'm perfectly willing to excuse your unfortunate behavior and let bygones be bygones. You will excuse me? We shall be bygones? Oh, you are so, so English. Mrs. King, really? I'll tell you again. You must leave at once. At once. Do you understand? I shall leave tomorrow. As I said, when my business is concluded. Really, madam, I must say that this is quite... Where are you, my dear? It's time for dinner. I must go. There is no fool like an English fool. I wash my hands of it. What an impossible woman. We had our dinner. There was plenty of animated conversation from Everard and stony silence and cutting glances from Mrs. King. It was a wild night. The wind howled, the rain pelted down, and thunder and lightning split the darkness. Cousin Everard had received more telegrams, which he took with him into his study. It was not until long after the household had retired to bed that he emerged, a cigar in one hand and a large tumbler of whiskey in the other. Now, my boy, I had hoped to sit down with you to get an idea of how your affairs stand. But I hadn't realized how late it was. It's almost one o'clock. Oh, well, uh... I I tell you what, my boy. You must jot it all down upon paper and let me have a note of the amount in the morning. Would you do that? Most certainly. Good, good. I'll understand it when I see it in black and white. Filthy night. Uh, High time we were in bed. I... I must just check on the cat before I go to bed. A high wind excites him. Will you come? I'd be glad to. Uh, Tread softly then, and don't speak, for everyone is asleep. We passed quietly down the lamp-lit hall, and through the door at the farther end. 
All was dark in the stone corridor, but a stable lantern hung on a hook, and my host took it down and lit it. As we approached the cat's room I could see no grating in the passage, so I knew that the beast was in its cage. Come in. Poor Tommy is not in the best of tempers. The storm has upset him. What a black devil he looks, doesn't he? I, I must give him a little supper to put him in a better humor. Would you mind holding the lantern for a moment? All right. His larder is just outside here. You will excuse me for an instant, won't you? What was that? Cousin? Have you bolted the door? Here, let me out. Let me out, I say. All right, don't make a row. You have the light, don't you? Yes, but I don't care about being locked in alone like this. Don't you? Well, you won't be alone for long. Let me out this instant, sir. I tell you, I don't care for practical jokes of any sort. And this one is particular. What are you doing? Roping the bars. No! No! With a scream, I seized the last bar with my hands and pulled with the strength of a madman. Clinging and clutching, I was dragged across the whole front of the cage until at last, with aching wrists and lacerated fingers, I gave up the hopeless struggle. The grating clanged back as I released it, and everything was still. In a moment, I heard the slam of the distant door. Then everything was silent. The cat had never moved during this time. He lay still in the corner. I saw his great eyes staring steadily at me. I had dropped the lantern when I seized the bars, but it still burned upon the floor. I made a movement to grasp it, with some idea that its light might protect me. But the instant I moved, I stopped and stood still, quivering with fear in every limb. The creature was not more than ten feet from me. The eyes glimmered like two discs of phosphorus in the darkness. They appalled and yet fascinated me. I could not take my own eyes from them. The beast stared at me for a long time and then seemed to lose interest. It rested its sleek, black head upon its huge forepaws, closed its eyes, and seemed to sleep. I stood stone still, lest I should rouse it. There was no way out. The door was locked. The windows were barred. No one would hear my cries for help this far from the main house. I knew in ten minutes the candle in the lantern would be out. In ten minutes, I'd be trapped in the dark with the Brazilian cat. I must do something. I must do something. I must... Hello. I saw a chance for something like safety. I have said that the cage had a top as well as a front, and this top was left standing when the front was wound through the slot in the wall. It consisted of bars at a few inches interval with stout wire netting between, and it rested upon a strong stanchion at each end. It stood now as a great barred canopy over the sleeping cat. The space between this iron shelf and the roof was two or three feet. If I could only get up there, squeezed in between bars and ceiling, I should be safe from below, from behind, and from each side. Only on the open face of it could I be attacked. It was now or never, for once the light was out, it would be impossible. <coughs> I sprang up. I seized the iron edge of the top and swung myself panting onto it. I writhed in, face downwards, and found myself looking straight into the terrible eyes and yawning jaws of the cat. It appeared, however, to be rather curious than angry. With the sleek ripple of its long black back, it rose and stretched itself. Rearing onto its hind legs with one forepaw against the wall, it raised the other and drew its claws across the wire mesh beneath me. One claw tore through my trousers and dug a furrow in my knee. The cat dropped down again, puzzled. He began walking swiftly round the room, looking up every now and again in my direction. I shuffled backwards until I lay with my back against the wall, screwing myself into the smallest space possible. The 
cat seemed more excited now that he had begun to move about, and he ran swiftly round and round the den, passing continually under the iron couch upon which I lay. The candle was burning low, and then, with a last flare and sputter, it went out altogether. I was alone in the dark, with the cat. There was nothing I could do. I stretched myself out and lay silently, almost breathlessly, hoping that the beast might forget my presence. That horrible purring seemed louder in the dark. It seemed to come from all around me. I thought of my cousin. I thought of his hatred of me, for what cause I could not tell. The more I thought, the more I saw how cunningly the thing had been done. No hint of blame would fall on him. I was quite certain he had his alibi well in place. A villain! I had to remember to keep quiet. I settled in to wait. I reckoned there were two hours until dawn. Two dreadful hours. At last, a faint glimmer of light came through the windows. I first dimly saw them as two grey squares upon the black wall, then grey turned to white, and I could see my terrible companion once more. And he could see me. It was cold, and the chill of the morning had made him irritable. With a continual growl, he paced swiftly up and down the side of the room farthest from me, his whiskers bristling angrily, and his tail switching and lashing. And as he turned at the corners, his savage eyes always looked upwards at me with a dreadful menace. I knew then that he meant to kill me. There was nothing I could use for a weapon. There was no one to hear my cries at this early hour. There was no means of escape. Or was there? I thought suddenly of the cage. The bars were still retracted into the wall. If I could move them back into position once more, I could find a refuge behind them. I would be inside the cage and the Brazilian cat on the outside. But could I pull them back? I hardly dared to move for fear of bringing the creature upon me, but it was my only chance. Slowly, very slowly, I put my hand forward until it grasped the edge of the front, the final bar that protruded from the wall. To my surprise, it moved quite easily. Apparently, it ran on some sort of wheels. I pulled again, and three inches of it came through. I pulled again, and... The cat sprang. In an instant, the blazing yellow eyes, the flattened black head with its red tongue and flashing teeth were within reach of me. The cat swayed there for an instant, the hind paws clawing to find a grip upon the edge of the grating, but it had misjudged its leap. It couldn't hold on. Scratching madly at the bars, it swung backwards and dropped heavily upon the floor. With a growl, it instantly faced round to me and crouched for another spring. I knew that I had to act now if I wanted to remain alive. It would not make the same mistake again. Pulling off my dress coat, I threw it down over the head of the beast. At the same moment, I dropped over the edge to the floor, seized the end of the front grating and pulled it frantically out of the wall. I rushed across the room, bearing the bars with me. As I rushed... I was upon the outer side. There was a moment's pause as I stopped and tried to pass in through the opening. In that moment, the creature tossed off the coat and sprang upon me. Ah! I hurled myself through the gap and pulled the rails behind me, but he seized my leg before I could get through. One stroke of that huge paw tore off my calf like a paring knife peeling an apple. Ah! The next moment, bleeding and fainting, I was lying among the foul straw with a line of friendly bars between me and the cat. He threw himself again and again against the bars, trying to find a way in. The cat strained to reach me with one paw, but I was too far back. There was blood on the paw. My blood. The beast pulled back and licked the blood off. Too wounded to move, too faint to be conscious of fear, I could only lie and watch it. Gradually, my mind drifted away, and I fell unconscious. I have no idea how long I lay there. 
What rose me to consciousness once more was a sound that I remembered from the night before. It was the shooting back of the bolt. Tommy? Tommy, my lad. Well, well, got him caged, eh, boy? He's done for. Look at all that blood. I suppose I'd better make sure. Best shut this door so nobody spies on us, eh, boy? Get back, Tommy. Get out of the way. Get back now. Stop playing the fool. Lying there, more dead than alive, I remembered my cousin's words when I had first seen the beast. This fellow has never yet tasted living blood, but if he does, he will be a terror. Living blood. My blood. No. No, get away. The blood. What? Oh, damn! You're still... Tommy, no! Get back! I'm your master! Mrs. King? Hmm. Where am I? You're in my house. You have been ill for many days. Ill? I only wish to say that you have yourself to blame alone. Did I not do all I could do for you? What? From the beginning, I tried to drive you from this house. By every means short of betraying my husband, I tried to save you from him. But you would not listen. I knew that he had a reason for bringing you here. What reason? No one knew him as I did. I had suffered for years under his cruelty. He was a worse beast than the one in the cage. I did not dare to tell you this. He would have killed me. But I did my best for you. It is a miracle of God you are still alive. Mm. What, what, what do you... As things have turned out, you have been the best friend that I have ever had. You have set me free. And I had fancied nothing but death would do that. At your service, madam. <laughs> that is an English joke, and you are still an English fool. They are taking you back to your own lodgings in the morning. I am leaving now. You will not see me again. I remember the bustling about. I remember a carriage, and then a train, and then another carriage, but not very clearly. Things kept going in and out. One thing I do remember with perfect clarity is two glowing yellow eyes staring at me from the blackness. Staring at me. Staring at me. Staring at me. Staring at me. Get away! Your lordship, are you all right? Oh, Mr. Drake, am I home? Yes, your lordship. I wonder why I merit a visit from my solicitor. Is someone suing me? <laughs> Not at all, your lordship. I was having a dream... What did you call me? Your lordship. That's a poor sort of joke, Mr. Drake. Oh, it's no joke. You're Lord Southerton now. You've been Lord Southerton for the last six weeks, but the doctor said we mustn't tell you until now. He said it might retard your recovery. Six weeks? Has it been six weeks since I was... Yes, my lord. He died on that very day. Your cousin, Mr. Everard, was next in line after you. 
If it had been your lordship instead of him that was torn to pieces by this tiger, or whatever it was, well, then... And that was the reason his wife spoke of. Crikey. I really am a fool. It turns out the late his lordship's valet was in Mr. Everard's pay. He'd send him telegrams every few hours on how the old gentleman was getting on. Business. It occupied him constantly. I beg your lordship's pardon? Never mind. What's this? It's a walking stick, my lord. The doctor said your lordship would be needing one from now on. Did he indeed? Yes, my lord. And I thought... Yes? I thought I might fetch the checkbook, my lord, if you're feeling up to it. It seems there are a few financial matters that require your lordship's attention. I should say so, Mr. Drake. Thank you. Yes, your lordship. It shan't be a moment. Oh, Mr. Drake. Yes, my lord. What became of the cat? They had to kill it before they could fetch your lordship out. Shot it through a loophole in the door, I understand. They got your lordship out of the cage and then took away what was left of Mr. Everard. Poor brute. Well, my lord, if I might be permitted an unprofessional comment, it was a bit of a judgment on him. Yes, I suppose so. But I didn't mean my cousin, Mr. Drake. It wasn't him I was thinking of. Oh? Oh, I see. How extraordinary. You've been listening to The Brazilian Cat, adapted for audio by Jim Court, from a short story by Arthur Conan Doyle. Featured in the cast were David Grant as Marshall King, Kevin Nash as Everard King, Dale Lena Evans as Marina King, Larry Groby as the carriage driver and Baldwin the groom, and Gary Layton as Everard's servant and Drake, Marshall's solicitor. Music by Lucien Dessar. Recording, sound patterns, and engineering was under the direction of Richard Froelich. Copyright 2004. This is a Texas Radio Theater Company production. You've just listened to Brazilian Cat Solo on the Sonic Society, and I'm Jack Ward. We return in a moment. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. This is a Spaceship Radio Podcast. Are you in the bag? No, but every week we'll bring you the best in science fiction radio from the 1950s. Now here they come, ladies and gentlemen. The Martians. And they will every week, right into your iPod. Just visit www.spaceshipradio.com for all the details. Prepare for maximum acceleration. That's spaceshipradio.com, where we rocket you into the past. Holy mackerel. We now return to the Sonic Society. And we're back. My name is Jack Ward, and you're listening to the Sonic Society. And here we have Andy Doan from Spaceship Radio, among other things. How are you today, Andy? Oh, very good, Jack. Thank you so much for coming in. I appreciate it. Hey, no problem. Now, Andy, I've called you in to talk with us because, uh, to be quite honest, I'm a fan of your podcast, Spaceship Radio. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is? Okay, well, Spaceship Radio is a podcast where we play episodes of old radio plays from the 1950s that are, have entered into the public domain, mostly X-1. Cool. And how long have you been running Spaceship Radio? Well, I started on September the 1st of 2005, so a few months, and we've got, I think we're at episode 29 by now. And I have every single one of them. I, I used to do X-1 when I was doing the Shadowlands. Uh, it was one of the old-time radios that I really enjoyed doing. What is it about X-1 do you think is so popular? I just like X-1 because, well, foremost, it's, it's an anthology. It's different stories every week, so you, you don't get attached to the characters, and any character at any time can just can just die. So I think that, that's one of the things that, that attracts me to it originally. But it's it's the writing. It You don't see that kind of writing in, in television today. It's, it's really fantastic, and the way they explore the different topics uh, having to do with science fiction, it's, it's very unique that way. And it's, it's unbelievable to me that this is going on, you know, 50 years ago, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, and I, 
I just think that people today need to uh, need to listen to these shows again because you know this is where writing was 50 years ago. Where are we today with it, and, and why aren't we you know one step above? One of the things I was thinking as I was listening to this show specifically about the science fiction was in some cases, you know as well as I do, that it's some of it's really archaic, but that's not what's important. It's not important that the science is good today. It's a matter of the stories that are being told. And I'm wondering if part of the problem is is we almost know too much about science. It could, it could be that. you know. Uh, and it's funny, sometimes you listen to it, and, and some of the things they say about Mars and the moon, you know, it, this is a society that, that had no idea what was going on out there to, to the, the way we do now. Um, but, you know, underneath it all, there was the, uh, the strong storylines. That, that pushed, pushed through the, the, the entire series. It wasn't so much important that the, that the science was, was correct. It was just that there was, it was storytelling at, at the very basis of it. So tell me how you got to being into this idea of doing a podcast, a regular podcast, and a very popular one for all intents and purposes. How did you get the idea in the first place to do this kind of thing? Well, I guess I just started listening to podcasts. I started um, back in the winter of 2005, and I heard a few different podcasts. And I was listening to amateur podcasters, and, and just because these were guys sitting in their in their basements in their bedrooms, yapping into a microphone, it just appeared. It just uh, immediately occurred to me, I can I can do this. But, um, you know, I had a couple of false starts with a couple of different ideas. And I had to think, what do I really want to, want to do? What, what do people want to listen to? What do I enjoy listening to? And that's where the idea came up. Because I was so into this, this old-time radio, why not bring that to the, the modern audience in this new medium? I think you hit on the number one thing. A lot of people ask, well, you know, how do I do this stuff? And I think it comes down to what do you love? What do you yeah. love to do? Cause yeah, I... you, have to, you have to do a show that you want to listen to. I think that's, that's what I do with, with my, both my podcasts. I have to make sure every episode is something that I'm enjoying listening to. That way I know that when other people are downloading, they're going to enjoy it too, well, hopefully. <laughs> and you offer a whole bunch of things in your podcast. I want to talk about the second one in a minute. But in, in Spaceship Radio specifically, you don't just have the podcast. You also have like a forum you have a little uh, wiki there that you are, are working on stuff. Tell us some of the things that you've thought up to try and be able to support this. Well, the thing with the spaceship radio and playing the old-time radio, um, it's, it's not sustainable that way. Eventually, we'll run out of shows, and I don't want to get into the position where we're having to rehash old episodes of uh, the x Men film because they're all available on my archives. So my idea is, well, we got to start making new episodes of these uh, radio plays modernized episodes with today's, you know, with today's technology and, and whatnot. So we have to get people writing these scripts, and who, who's really doing it? Who's, uh, there's people out there that are uh, fascinated about science fiction, people even uh, dabbling in writing science fiction. Why not get those people focused on writing scripts for, a, you know, a new brand of radio dramas? So I put together a script wiki where people who are interested can basically sketch out an outline of a script and other users of the website and listeners of my show can come in and fill in their their uh, information as uh, as they see fit. So basically, it's, it's like uh, writing 2.0, I like to call it. <laughs> and so far, it's done pretty good. We, we've really, uh, we've hashed out about four different scripts in there in, in various uh, areas of completion. But, you know, that's we want to move forward with that more coming into the new year. The other, the other feature of the site we have is the message board where people can come on and talk about what episode of the show is their favorite and, and just talk about stuff that way. It's, it's really it's really great and it's been uh, taken up fairly well. So tell me about some of the people that add into these uh, to the script wiki and, and to the your blog afterwards, the forum. Are they mostly from Canada? Because I know you're Canadian. Or are they from the United States? Where do they come from? Oh no, it's unbelievable. They come from all over the world. I had uh, a guy from Ireland. He was contributing quite regularly and you know Beyond that, unless someone specifically tells me, you know, I'm from this country, I have no idea. And I, I make no assumptions, of course, you know, being on the Internet. <laughs> and that's one of the great things. Like, we're communicating and we're getting ideas from people that, from all walks of life and all over the planet. So it, a lot of these, these stories are getting, I, like, getting uh, points of view that normally, sitting in on a, at a typewriter or a word processor by myself in Canada, I would never come up with. 
that's the exciting thing I find in the stuff that we do at the Sonic Society, and I can hear it in your voice, is this real excitement of collaboration, this real idea that you have of, look, I'm not just putting stuff on for nobody to hear. I want feedback, and you say that in every one of your shows. Yeah, and I get a lot of it. It's, it's, it's really great because, you know, the feedback, it's, it's not, I don't want to hear people write back to me and say, oh, you're great, you're doing a good job. I want people to, to come up with something that uh, it's not apparent to me. That's the best, that's the, the power of the Internet. Uh, approaching people from other societies and other, you know, other walks of life, other nationalities. They, they just, they, because of the way they, they live in a different part of the world, they think about things differently, and that's the way I want to be able to think about things. So do you get a chance to people uh, give reviews for each show? Um, well, no, I haven't really, I haven't really done that. But uh, there's a lot of places on the internet where that's that's uh, available. One of the things, uh, like I said, I, I I appreciate most is the introductions that you do on your show. It's funny. I like I've listened to many of the X minus ones, and I'm listening to a whole bunch that I haven't heard before, and I really appreciate those, and I tune into them. But I actually really enjoy having a podcast because of your introductions. You have a great way of being able to introduce things like topical things about science, which may inter- you know interact with the show. You uh, used to have, you don't do it anymore, but you used to have a catchphrase almost for every single show. That you- yeah, i got to get back to doing that. <laughs> and you know, now you're almost taking up some of your time with just all the great announcements that are coming on. How much time do you spend getting ready for your show? Well, the show starts, the new show starts usually almost immediately after the, the previous show is, is released. I begin outlining what I'm, what I'm going to talk about based on what I, I talked about in the previous episode, and I just write that down on a little outliner. And as emails come in or as you know news comes in, I just add to that outline. So when I'm ready to do the actual, um, the actual vocals for that episode, I do that the day before I release the podcast. So it basically takes a week to prepare. As far as the, the audio files of the, uh, the old, old-time radio goes, I'll usually set that in my my audio editor almost immediately after the last episode is, is updated again. And I'll just pick away at it. So it takes a week, but really if, if I was able to sit down and, and take four hours, I could do the entire show. But just this way I kind of spread my time over the whole week and I'm not sitting here focusing on it and, and you know, maybe getting making it a little tedious. Now it's been so successful that you've actually opened up another podcast of a sort. Can you tell us what that one is? Yeah, well, really, um, Spaceship Radio was a great way for me to get on board with the podcasting. But I've always been really interested in, you know, fringe scientific discoveries and discussions. So the next thing I wanted to do was this podcast called Beyond Science. It's a lot like, I guess it's been described as the Coast to Coast show with George Norrie, but without the New Age uh, perspective on it. Right. I talked to different people that are supposed experts in, in their, their fields, and we just discuss, uh, you know, their passions, what, what they're talking about, what they're researching. And a lot of the, the topics tend to be, you know, a little, little bit out there. Like, for example, we talked to, to, to a guy from Australia who believes that the Earth is, is a hollow shell with uh, these creatures living in the middle, which, you know, it, it, sounds, it sounds ridiculous, but the thing about this, this guy is absolutely convinced that this is the truth. So respectful of that, I interview him as if he's presenting uh, a real theory, and it, it was inter- it's interesting that way. And that's what we're doing with Beyond Science. Every week, we're talking to a, a I don't know what you call them, a researcher or an expert in different areas, and we just cut, try to help them get their story out to people. So I'm not trying to tell people what they should or shouldn't believe. I'm just giving them as much information as I can, and they're charged with making that, their decision for themselves. And I think that's one of the secrets to doing a good interview is just being really interested in what's going on, whether you believe what the person's saying or not, just sort of setting that aside. And yeah, well, you have to appreciate that they're passionate about it and they believe it. You, you can't put your beliefs on somebody else. I guess that's what I do with that show. This is Jack Ward, host of The Sonic Society. Each week we bring the very best of audio cinema from around the world to our members, and up until recently, we could only accept fully completed projects. Now it's your chance. You don't need a sound studio or a mic to contribute. Go to www.sonicsociety.org and find the Consortium Comics link. 
Consortium Comics is an audio comic book project where you get to give us your original superhero stories. Our talented Shadowlands Theatre Troupe will take your scripts, record them with music and sound effects, and put them on the air. Listen to the Sonic Society each week and now become a contributing member of Consortium Comics. Because audio cinema is not just something you listen to, it's movies in your head. is hot. The hole's aflame. And out! <clears throat> Every time I touch the outer walls, I burn myself. Ow! Oh, man, that's hot. Ow! Yes, that's too hot. Ow! Can't, can't see the portal, just flame. This medical center must be made of some flame retardant material. Can't see what's burning us. Could these Norwegians have flamethrowers? But, Angel! I almost forgot. Great day. Ow! Oh, it's still hot. That sweet girl sacrificed herself for the professor and I, and... Where did he go? Yes, I remember now. He left out that secret passageway. Perhaps if I can... No. No good. It's sealed. Whatever way the professor left, he made certain I couldn't follow. Wait. What's that? Outside. The fire. It's slowing. I can see. It looks like, yes, clouds. We must be flying. How is that possible? But it's true. And I can feel the, the movement slowing. And the gravity is, is, is back. No need to cling on to the consoles anymore. Can walk on own two feet. There! Outside. Flame's completely out now. And it feels like we're hovering. Hovering in the air. Hovering in the air with, without a balloon or... Great Guelph's ghost, what was that? Some beast flew by the portal. No, not a beast. A man. There's a man on the wing. I mean, th there's a wing on that man. I mean, there's a man with wings. Two men. Three. And one, he's riding a chariot with two great horses the color of the sun. They aren't hooked together directly, more on a loose tether that allows them to fly, each of them with their own tremendous wings. Imagine that. What's that? Someone knocking on the door. If it's the Norwegians, I'll give them a fight. But where? Here, that's... yes. That's where it's coming from. From the portal the prof slid out of. Just need to throw my back into the hole. There. That's got it. Now let's see. Hello in there. It seems you are in need of assistance. Stand back, Agent of Norway. I may not have a gun, but this pipe in my hand will make short work of you if you try anything funny. <laughs> 
little wingless warrior, my people are keeping your barge aloft in the sky. Without our help, you'll be food for the lion dogs below my mountain. Then I owe you my life. Great, old, large, winged, bearded, stranger. Guy? My name is Tal. I am the rightful chin of the entire clouded lands of Osprey. My wingmen are cool and crawl. Our hunting flock has your paw in the grip of a harpoon mullivator. Harpoon what, Peter? There's many of the things we can talk about, my man. Will you come with me to my nest? Can't help Angel and the Professor hanging here. Thanks for the invite, my good man, and me without a kegger to offer in return. Kegger? Yeah. Grasping Talon's feathery hand, Biff maneuvers to the chariot that hovers carefully, the two magnificent pegasi flapping their wings in perfect unison to the slow movement of the pod. Our Percival of the past is uneasy beside the great Jim, war leader of the Falcon Men of Osprey. The Falcon Men cheer loudly as they release the strange harpoon that had pierced the wall of the lad pod. The strange metal that kept it defying gravity no longer has power. And Biff watches the discarded bay once again continue its spiraling spin until it disappears below the clouds. The sound of its final thunderous crash lost against the winds of the moon of Avia. Never has our hero been witness to such amazing events! And it is in wonderment that he speaks to the sturdy Jin Talon. Now! Never have I been witness to such amazing events, Talon. This is a part of the Earth I've never seen on the Discovery Channel. Well, not on Earth, Biff Straker. That is why you are so wingless and helpless. Well, never mind. At least you are not the madman of Clayoria. We are our sworn enemies. If we're not on Earth, where are we? On Avia, my friend. Home of the Falcon Men, of course. And the land of the winds. <laughs> Those clouds below. There. There. Do you see it? They hide huge mountains and rocky crevices. Don't see any farmlands. Farmlands? I ye daft, man. Maybe there's nothing but mountains. That's what makes it so beautiful. Farmlands, indeed. What would you do with farmlands, little wingless warrior? Uh, farm. Ha 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 ha! It's an attack from the cast! The cast? Cast of what? Can't be as bad as that! I, I mean, I've heard the Broadway versions of Cats is nasty, but... The cast out, Big Straker! They who were cast out from their nests! They must have attacked from the sun! They live in the sun? No, Big Straker! They fly in from the direction of the sun so we can't see them! Da! Hold on! They're forcing us down! <coughs> I thought you told me that there were only mountains on this moon! <laughs> there are! I never said we'd be landing, only going down! No! Good night! Out of the flying pod and into the fire! Down, ever down, the Falcon men are pressed by these new adversaries! As hard as they try to escape, the cast ride great griffins! Part bird, part horse, part dragon, merely blotting out the sky above the avian warriors. It is all that Biff can do to hold tightly to the flying chariot as they continue to descend like an out-of-control rocket through the misty gray of space. Farther and farther they fall, the harsh landscape of the mountains jutting up at Biff like a hungry maw full of misshapen teeth. Is this the end of our hero at time's end? Is this the finish of the final Frontiers football fighter? Stand by, Biff Straker and Spaceways will return.
And that's this week's show. Thanks so much for participating in the Sonic Society. Next week in the Society, Love is in the Air with a special treat. A never-before-broadcast Shadowland player's dark comedy, Spin, Spin, Spin. Join us then, won't you? The Sonic Society was produced and directed weekly by Andrew Dorfman and Jack Ward. Theme music by Sharon B. The Society originates from CKDU in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, which can be found on the web at www.ckdu.ca and is also rebroadcast through affiliated stations around Canada and the United States of America. Look for upcoming episodes and schedules for the Sonic Society through our website at www.sonicsociety.org. See you next week at this same time in the Society. Until then, I'm Jack Ward.